Hello and welcome to Inside the Artist Studio. I'm Rose Frederick and I am here today with my good, good friend, David Michael Slonum. Hello, Mr. Slonum. Hey, Rose. How are you? Doing great. Can't wait to talk with you. Wonderful. Hey, so you are sending me some work to Denver. You're beaming mm -hmm. in from Indiana. I and, am. Yeah. And sending me some work in Denver mm -hmm. for Contemporary Realism Now. And anybody who is tuning in and looking over your shoulders, they're probably scratching their heads. Really? I think so. Well, I might have a shampoo I could recommend. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tell so, me what you mean by that. Well, uh, we are going to talk about that. Okay. So you are in contemporary realism now. Mm -hmm. um, and so the whole concept in my curatorial brain about this show is to push open the boundaries of contemporary realism. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're one of the perfect people to do that. And uh -huh. so a little back history, you and I met 15, 20 years ago. It was back a ways. It was, and you were actually doing la some landscape painting, but they were pretty minimal. Mm -hmm. And then one year you sent me some paintings. We talked about it um, beforehand. And I remember saying something like, go big or go home, just send them. And these were just so barely hinged in realism, those trees right. with the Yes, shadows. right. So take it from there. So I remember that very clearly. Uh, so I was a landscape painter for 18 to 20 years and painting outdoors from life. But I was also very interested in learning what it is about an image that moves a viewer emotionally. Mm -hmm. And so I was constantly reading and I had stacks of art books by my bed. My, my wife would be reading her novels and I'd be going through art books, like scouring the books to figure out what was in the master's mind. Mm -hmm. How do they do it? Uh, so I was looking at Cezanne and Picasso, and I was looking at Chagall. And, and one of the things that I, I really began to do is pay attention to those artists whose work was disturbing to me, hmm. but whose work also kept attracting me. And I okay. didn't. Yeah, go ahead. What th this is, I just want, I just want you to repeat that you paid attention to work that disturbed you. I did, and but I don't mean disturbed as in repulsed. I mean, I didn't understand it, mm -hmm. but I, I felt compelled to keep engaging with it. Like I, there was something going on that was attractive, mm -hmm. but the disturbing part was I didn't understand it because I'm looking at like Cezanne breaking nature into little uh, like mosaics of color. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not photographic realism. That's not even representation in the way I learned how to do it in school or in workshops. I'm looking at Picasso, right? And so he's breaking nature into different sorts of chunks of parts and pieces. And, you know, at first that's very disorienting or can be. And mm -hmm. I think it is for a lot of people, like you mentioned. Um, but it took years of, of dealing with that before I understood what was happening. Mm -hmm. And it was Cezanne who really unlocked it for me in combination with reading people like Robert Henry, the oh. art spirit. Oh, and uh, there's a book called Composition by Arthur Wesley Dow, who was uh, Georgia O'Keeffe's instructor mm. or mentor. And he wrote, a, he wrote that book in 1899. So these ideas have been around for at least 120 years out there in the public. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea is that, here it is. Are you ready for this? Yes. Abstract art is music for your eyes. Ooh. So what that means is, there is no game being played on you. This is not a scam. There's no charlatan activity involved here. What this is, is tones arranged in space to please the eye, to move the soul. And in that sense, it's the same thing as music. Music is tones in time to please the ear, to move the soul. Hmm. So anyone who loves music already loves abstract art they just don't know it by that name. Wow. Every time you listen to any piece of music, but especially instrumental music, you are listening to an abstract arrangement of tones and it's moving you emotionally. 
And so abstract painting is doing the exact same thing visually instead of through the ear, it's through the eye. And it's an arrangement, an abstract arrangement of tones, you could say, to move you emotionally. Wow. And I learned that by staring at Cezanne for years and then staring at nature. So I began to, um, you can interrupt me anytime, by the way. No. I began no. to be fascinated by how it's the underlying abstract structure of a painting that moves the viewer, whether we're talking about Rembrandt or Sargent or Cezanne or Picasso or Rothko. Uh, the, 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 whether it's realism or abstract on the surface isn't really the issue. The issue is what is the arrangement of shapes, values, colors, textures? What's the musicianship behind it mm. visually? And I got very fascinated by that. So I began interpreting trees in the forest around where I live as pieces of color mm. with, with a permission slip from Uncle uh, Paul Cezanne. And, uh, and so I would happily go out into the woods and begin breaking down what I was seeing into a, a textural pattern of color shapes. And uh, I remember on March 19th of 2013, I painted one of those from memory in my studio after mm -hmm. being out in the woods. And I looked down at my table because I was painting on a tabletop and I realized I now understand what this is. I saw a door open in front of me on that tabletop. Wow. And I, I said right there and then, I am now not only aspiring to be an abstract painter, I am one and I know why. Wow. So that's when it started, March 19th of 2013. Wow. That? That's pretty I, great. Birthday as an abstract painter. <laughs> yeah, wow, that's really, you know, so like, Part of the reason I wanted you to repeat that about looking at things that mm -hmm. maybe got under your skin yes. is I think for collectors that that is the key to really one, understanding art, but two, understanding yourself. Yes. Really well said. Yeah. Yes. Because if it's resonating with you, it's, it's resonating with you. Mm -hmm. There is something that's already present within your soul or your spirit or your emotional makeup yep. that hears its name being called. That's how I think of it. It's like Kermit the Frog saying, have you, have you been half asleep and have you heard voices and have they been calling your name? Mm. That's what's happening. The art is calling to you. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a part of us, sometimes it was true for me, where that made me uncomfortable. Because I didn't understand that part of me, and I certainly didn't understand what was happening in the art. Well, and, there's, I, and yeah. there's a fear, I would think, as an artist, this is your livelihood. And you're right. just going along, and then all of a sudden you go, <laughs> you know? And, and you're hoping that everybody comes along with you. Or that maybe you, as you head out in this other path, people are like, who's this guy? Wow, where'd he come from? This is amazing. You know, I, you know? So I would see it, I would describe it slightly differently. Rather than a sharp turn, to me, it feels like a natural progression. Mm -hmm. And I would describe my realism or my representational period as booster rockets that mm -hmm. fell away, but the trajectory stayed the same. Oh. I'm okay. still going to the moon. I just don't need the booster rockets for me at this stage. I love that. That's a great analogy. You know what? I want to do a screen share and dive into some of these pieces. And let's talk about, um, uh, well, let's just talk about the work. And, okay. and if you wouldn't mind sharing just any stories or thoughts or you know okay so mm -hmm. wow um one thing that staring at picasso and miro and calder and ellsworth kelly and others uh one thing that did for me is it it demolished any reluctance to be whimsical or playful oh as a form of high art mm-hmm and then I think about musicians like Elton John. Don't tell me Elton John's not playful. Don't tell me Paul McCartney didn't have a playful streak a mile wide. Yeah. We all live in a yellow submarine. Are you kidding me? Well, that was, uh, right? that was Ringo, I think. <laughs> okay, well, whatever. 
Yeah, you know. I mean, pick, pick, you know. There's playfulness uh, woven all through the Beatles repertoire, which I love. I love the piccolo in Penny Lane, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just playful. And so, and jazz music is another thing. So I grew up playing trombone. I was in a jazz band. I was in orchestra and Mm -hmm. all that. But if you think about what is jazz music, it's, there's a structure in terms of a chord progression and a rhythm that's laid down. And then the instrumentalist improvise over the top of that. Mm -hmm. And so for me, painting is really similar. So I, I created this color situation, you could say, which is like the chords. And I made up my mind with this particular painting, I am going to do a jazz solo. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a one take only. And I'm going to I'm going to paint a line improvisationally and intuitively and just see where it goes. And I did this slowly. And I, in my mind, I played this mental game with myself that I think I may have talked to you about privately, where it's, it's called save the world, right? So I, I pretend I'm a patient in an insane asylum and that I actually sincerely believe that it's up to me to save the world by making this line perfect. You know, I'm like, I have to get it right. And for me, that's, that's another w- form of being playful, but it also helps me focus and care, you know? Yeah. Um, so anyways, that's what this painting is. It's like, I'm going to draw this line in this space, and I'm going to carve up this space using one line as an improvised jazz solo kind of thing and just see what happens. And if it doesn't work, I'll throw it away and do another one. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I did the I did the light gray line. It's not actually white, it's light gray. Mm-hmm. And that's basically one shot. You know, it's it's one brush, one color, one shot. And then I thought, hmm, something saying red circle. I'm going for it nice it might not work but it might yeah so i painted the red circle and this piece is called juggler it's called juggler number one and so the jugglers oh i should say the titles of all of my paintings happen after the fact ah okay i never ever ever title them ahead of time because i'm not an illustrator Mm -hmm. i was an illustrator for 20 years i did magazine advertising book covers children's books Mm -hmm. all kinds of things and in, when you're an illustrator, you are always creating an image to accompany or explain a verbal idea. Mm-hmm. With fine art, we have the privilege of coming in the back door. We're coming in through the visual to affect the emotions. It does not depend on the verbal at all. And at least in my case, I don't want it to. Yeah. I want to, I want the part of the fun for me is the, just the sheer discovery and the pleasure of being surprised by my own work. Yeah when I allow myself to get in that right brain creative space where things just flow intuitively and then, you know, you start improvising and then you step back and you're like, wow, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. I did not know that was in me. (laughs) Yeah. It's interesting about titles. I, so at some point I want to do a whole like blog on titling your artwork Uh because for, for a lot of artists, it's, it's just the worst part of it. But I know, like I was just talking to Daniel Sprick, Uh he actually has created these huge works based Uh on a line in a poem or based on, you know, and it'll kind of work on him. And then this whole incredible thing comes out. But I think, like, I think that's so fascinating that because I think as a former illustrator, that's got to be just so freeing for one yes. but then to not have any preconceived notion i think you need yeah. to be untethered from all of that to now, and i would say that's me personally i love daniel sprick's work i respect him as an artist yeah. like crazy yeah and so i would want to say to any artist who might hear this this is not a rule for every artist this is sure. me on my journey and coming from where i came from and where i am now that's something i need to do for my process Right. And, and, and all I wanted to like, kind of get to is that titles are really pivotal kind of pieces of the artwork and whether they come before or after or Mm -hmm. in the middle or something, you know, I, I just think that I think people just, it's like a throwaway, but it's, it's not, it's really, there's something there's a thread of what's in this work. And this is another piece too, that is a juggler. And yes. 
and, and so was this one kind of with the same thought process? Exactly the same. Yep. Mm -hmm. wow. I decided uh, the same. I made, I set up the same parameters and did the same game in my head. Mm -hmm. And I just really enjoy looking at these. Yeah. And, I, and I've wondered, you know, part of the surprise of doing what I do is it's a surprise. And so after the fact, I sit with these on the wall and then I start wondering, well, why do I like that so much? Hmm. Like I try, I'm trying to understand my own work. Yeah. Which is kind of cool in a way, because it is like you mentioned in the very beginning, it's a process of self-discovery. Mm -hmm. So when a collector is is experiencing something with a painting, it's a good idea to sit back and consider, well, what is it about that work that is moving me or is like firing my imagination in this way, what's happening? And then as you answer that question for yourself, then you're enabled to enjoy the work even more. Mm -hmm. And I think it probably becomes even more personal to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's true. Yeah. That's true for me. I think that I'm, I'm, this is such a wonderful conversation because I think um, for me to hear an artist talk about the sitting back and, and really doing that self-interrogation of what is, what's happening right here that I love this instead of, you know, you're wrangling an image in to fit something, but instead you're working intuitively and yeah. let's say with a higher level of an emotional IQ about the work possibly. Cause I mean, so, so so one of the, one of the pieces of feedback I received from a collector through a gallery, this is, you know, I don't have direct access to this person, but he owns something like 20 to 25 pieces of mine, which is wow. a wonderful thing. I'm yeah. so grateful. Yeah. But I heard through the gallery that he said that he deals with numbers all day. Mm -hmm. um, and he was a very high level executive. And, and he said, I love coming home to this work because it opens up a whole new part of my brain and a whole new emotional space for me that I don't get to live in during the day. And that, that really meant a lot to me. Um, you know, that's that, quite fascinating too, because art is art and music for sure. Right. Um, very mathematical. There's a lot of very beautiful math and geometry yep. and 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 the interesting thing about it on the painting side is it's it's intuitive, so it's coming from sort of an unconscious or subconscious place for me. But it does, like obviously, there's geometry involved here, mm -hmm. but the geometry part is above my pay grade. <laughs> I'm, I'm like just the, you know, the low level guy who's playing with the stuff. I don't actually understand the stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but what's what's fascinating to me is a lot of my collectors tend to be surgeons or mathematicians or professors or uh, doctors of one kind or another. And I think it's because they're using the analytical part of their brain big time all day long. And they're very technical and very uh, precision in, in a sequential kind of a way. And I think my art probably helps to free up the other part of them that's already there. But it's just like knocking on the door and saying, hey, this part of you is allowed to come out and play too. So have a glass of wine and may, and maybe you'll be refreshed as you allow that part of yourself to just roam around a little bit. Like in its slippers and robe, let that part of you come out and enjoy a, a walk around the house. You know, as you're talking about that and who buys your work predominantly, it, it makes me think that in a sense, your work is giving them permission to play. I, I think that may be true. Uh, I, I, hope I don't know, right? But I, I had a collector here in Indiana who was—he's um, gone now, but he—he he was one of the wealthiest men in Indiana and a very uh, pivotal figure in a lot of high-end organizations around the world, actually. And so when he met me we had enough one-on-one -on -one time that I think I may have been one of the only people in his world to be silly with him. Mm. And so he and I would get to laughing. Uh. Just the two of us in his car or just sitting in his living room, having a joke. And I loved that I was given the privilege of being that person in his life. Cause the rest of his life is white tie fundraising affairs kind of thing. 
Yeah. Very formal, very proper, very polite. And with me, there was a lot of just laughing our heads off. Mm. And I wonder, I hope, wouldn't it be great if my work could sort of be that for people? Oh, wow. Or like love- this, it's, it's, it's a harmony, but it's also got a playful streak in it. Mm-hmm. That's kind of refreshing, I hope. That's what I would aspire to. You know, I think it is a thing to me when I try to explain when when people ask me, well, what should I collect? Or is this something that um, I should collect? You know, and, and I think so many things that we've talked about in this short period of time, I think are really vital to understand. But I think one of the biggest keys to me when I'm really putting artwork out in front of people, whether it's Mm -hmm. abstraction or representational photography, ceramics, whatever it is, I want the collector to know when they're looking at that work, you're meeting David. Mm -hmm. This is him. Yeah. That's interesting because can, can I just, can I just jump all over what you're saying? Go ahead. So one of the um, things that's been fun in recent years is as I've sat back and wondered, where in the world is this coming from? I have realized that this is actually probably the most authentically me Hmm. work that I've ever done. And I actually have some images here on my desktop I wanted to share with you, if that's okay. Oh yeah, okay, wait, so let me just, okay, Okay, wait. Um, So let me just, well, we have um, Sunny Loves Cha-Cha. Yep. Um, and then just tell me about this one briefly, and then I'm going to f- switch out and then you show me. Okay. So, well, like I said, the titles always come after the fact. Mm-hmm. So what I'm doing is first of all, playing with the line and I'm working with the line drawing over and over again and refining it until as a line drawing, I would want to live with it on the wall, mm-hmm. just in black and white. Mm-hmm. Cause it, and it's like a melody for a pop song or a, or a classical, a classical piece. If the melody line doesn't move you it doesn't matter how many layers of orchestration you put in there or how much production is added well that's a great way to think about it yeah and so the so so the line has to work and what the line is doing is organizing the space and uh, and creating that impact visually so then the color comes later and then the title way way later so my thought here was to play with uh sort of warm southwesty colors i wanted these warm kind of pinks, melons, and oranges, and peaches, and stuff against browns and grays. And it ends up having this southwesty kind of a vibe to it. Uh, but also, as I looked at it, it looked, I don't know why, but in my imagination, it sort of looked like somebody dancing. And I, you know, it hasn't been too many years since my wife and I took ballroom dancing lessons. And one of our favorite dances was the cha-cha. So I just uh. thought it would be Again, the title is an opportunity to emphasize the playfulness mm-hmm. of the situation. So Sunny loves to cha-cha. I, I love the idea of somebody who's just obsessed with the cha-cha, you know. Yeah. Sunny just loves the cha-cha. He can't stop. So. Well, and you know what? It's an interesting thing, too, because, I mean, I'm... I would tread all over your feet. I can't dance. I just... I, I come from a long line of polka dancers. <laughs> yeah um so but but uh the title too then you know one it's playful but on the other hand also you know dancing there are formal rules to it yes right and so this image is not chaotic right this image has rhythm and repeat with variation and an order and a structure and yeah like a dance yeah, exactly. But the other thing about this image and many of them is it's one continuous line that loops back on itself. Wow. Or in many cases, it actually connects. And this one, there's two open ends, but it's just one line. Hmm. And that that game, that idea for that game came from Alexander Calder in his wire sculptures and Pablo Picasso in his animal drawings, mm-hmm. specifically. There's also some beautiful Ellsworth Kelly drawings of flowers. That, And I think there's some Matisse drawings, too, that I'm remembering, line drawings. Yep. Um, so yeah, in that sense, it's it's very much connected to the artists who most inspire me. Wow. Okay. I have one more image of yours, but you were going to show me something. Well, yeah. So we were talking about, um, I forget how we got on it, but being authentically yourself. Mm-hmm. 
and even for collectors to recognize why am I drawn to these kinds of images and like why am I collecting this? <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I keep I keep doing it. That's why it's right. called collecting. Yeah. <laughs> so, so as I was thinking about my own history and where is this coming for, from, I'm I'm working with line. I'm working with planes of color, mostly flat looking planes of color. And there's a sense of whimsy or playfulness about it. Mm -hmm. So then I thought back to my history and I realized my father took me out to fly a kite, a box kite, which is planes of color with light coming through it, mm -hmm. connected to a line, connected to love. And in my dad's case, a very playful person. Mm -hmm. And before I could speak, I was given this toy, play plaques, to play with. So I was probably one and a half, maybe two at the most, when I started building with play plaques, which are these translucent planes of color that the child puts together and light comes through. And you're doing it in the context of your family. So it's connected to love. And in the background, mom and dad are laughing, right? So planes of color with light and line connected to love. Mm. Like, oh, not only, and then my mother, without realizing it, had a Picasso print. She realized that. She didn't realize she was influencing her son. She had a Picasso print in the kitchen. She had an Alexander Calder replica mobile in the kitchen. Really? There was Henry Moore book on the coffee table in the living room. Huh? Uh, there was a Van Gogh sunflower print in our family room. So I grew up with some of the finest examples of contemporary art, modern art in the world, in the house in the background of my life. Wow. So that was there too. And it was mostly abstraction or leaning heavily toward abstraction. So as I go back and I, and I reassemble, and I could think about watching television. I watched the Peanuts cartoons. I watched the Muppets. What is a television image? It's light, it's planes of color. It's connected to laughter and love. Looney Tunes, it's the same thing. So from all these different angles, those things were like put into my DNA as a child. And then as an adult, I find myself painting planes of color with light connected to line and love and laughter. Oh, yeah. I get it. This is me. Right, it feels, so I'm not putting on an act. I didn't go, hmm, I wonder what's gonna sell. I never do that. But it is so helpful to be able to look at this wall behind me and recognize that this is completely honest to who I am. And whether anybody else enjoys it or not, when I'm painting it, isn't the point. Of course, I love it when people enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> but there's the freedom to know, this is me. This is, this is real. This is my honest presentation of what I am. And I, I love it when it connects with people. I can't even tell you. Because it connects with me first. Yeah. I don't know if people know this about, about artists, but there's this moment in the studio where you're struggling with this thing that is not working. And every single time there's the second thoughts and the doubts, am I a fool? Should I have even tried this image? Should I throw it away and start over? And then you press through and this thing clicks into a harmony and it's like Adam taking its first breath. All of a sudden this thing is alive and it's resonating with you. You could even say speaking to you. And I, I sit back every time and I'm like, how did that happen? And what a gift that I get to experience that. Wow. That shock of surprise that this thing is now living and breathing, you could say. Mm -hmm. So then to put it out in the world and have that happen for someone else just doubles the gift or maybe beyond that. It's, it's an amazing thing. I don't understand what I do. <laughs> You know, I, I think there's a, I think there's a gift in, in that exact thing because there's a, whatever you want to call it, but there's just a lot of faith. Yes. You know, in the perseverance, I was talking with a sculptor yep. who she refused to tell me her age, but I'm going to guess she's in her eighties. Oh my. And, um, she and knows what she's talking about. She's been around the block. Yes. But she said, there's a point in the sculpture when you look at it, it's exactly what you're saying and it's done. It's like the spirit is in it. Yes. And she said, now there's just a few details, but it's done. Yes. And I was yes. And for me, there's this quiet that comes over me mm. or the sense of peace. Like it is startling and wonderful. And 
Like that's what I'm working for. That's what this is about. I want that feeling of peace to wash over me. And, and maybe you could even say, dare I say joy sometimes. Uh, and, and, and that's what I'm sharing. Like, that's why people collect, I think, is because they're getting that sense of peace or joy or harmony or something. Yeah. Like beauty is a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. Harmony is a powerful thing. And it does something to our souls. That's hard to put into words, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's right. I, I know it's right. It's, it's kind of miraculous that one, you can, you get to live in that space right creating it but two you give it away essentially you put that those things out there because it's i mean honestly when you're i i think when you're being that truthful and that authentic to put it out there in the world then and mm -hmm. let people comment on it mm -hmm. that i can see how a lot of artists would not want to do that yeah um Scary. what's in, what's interesting for me is there's always a little bit of that struggle i guess mm -hmm. uh, somewhere in the background but because i know exactly why i'm painting the way i'm painting i know what this is and where it comes from like we just said so i know that this is actually me there's a there's a freedom in that because it's okay if it only gets three likes on whatever platform. It doesn't matter, really. Mm -hmm. I'm not thrown off by that. Mm -hmm. Like I might be, if I were if I were looking to the crowd to tell me what to do or asking someone else to call the tune for me, well, yeah, then that would be very disconcerting. Right. But but so, I don't know, maybe it's partly my age. I'm, I'm 57. I've been doing this a long time. And so there's this freedom that comes with loving the audience enough. I, th I don't think it's disregard for the audience. I think it's actually loving and respecting the audience enough to give them what's true about me because I think it's also true about some of them. And I think when they hear their name called through the art, there's this gratitude that wells up in the collector. I've heard them say it to my face. I've had people hug me through tears oh. as they're writing the check because they were just given a piece of themselves back that they didn't even really know they were missing. Wow. Yes, but that's what's so powerful about this. And so if I can be my authentic self, I'm actually giving a gift to the audience out of respect for them. And, and it's something they didn't know to ask for in advance. And so that's part of the magic of this whole transaction that fascinates me. And I'm so thankful to be part of that weird world where that even happens. Wow, that's incredible. Um, tell me about chicken. On chicken the on the run. <laughs> well, I told you titles always come later. So yep. this image, uh, so one of the things that I love about these paintings in particular, they always start with a doodle on a little piece of notepad or a, even a post-it note small with ballpoint pen or a pencil and I just take a line and I play a little game what happens if I take this line for a walk and reconnect it with itself and I picture it as surely Elton John in the shower one day slipped and went I'm still standing <laughs> and then he's like oh I'm still standing hey yeah. Bernie I think that's a song get on it <laughs> right yep. stuff like that must happen all the time you know, Michael Jackson's, you know, driving down the street and he's like, dear, 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 dear. he's just humming to himself. Right. And then he's like, Quincy, I think we got one here. Right. So it's it starts out as a ditty or a hum or a nothing throwaway thing like a doodle. Yeah. But then you love it into existence mm -hmm. and you say, no, 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 there's magic in that thing. That is the embryo of the Olympic athlete. That is the acorn that is the oak tree later. That's the seed that becomes the forest. I am going to make that into what it's promising to be. That's the commitment in the beginning is no, this isn't a silly little throwaway. And this is what I would say to art students and artists also is, you have to learn to believe in your ideas and trust your instincts. That's part of your gift. And when that thing resonates with you, 
This is true for collectors too, by the way. Mm -hmm. When it resonates with you, there's a reason for that. Don't ignore it. It's It means something. Mm -hmm. So I have learned to trust when my internal artistic resonator thing goes off to pay attention. Yeah. So, so I will draw like a hundred doodles and three of them will call my name hmm. and I will throw the rest away. And sometimes I'll sit down with my wife and we'll spread them all out on the living room floor. We've done this multiple times oh. and we'll sit there together and be like this one, that one, and that one, the rest of them go in the trash or these five and the rest of them can wait for later. Yeah. And so then you love the thing into existence and then it becomes a game. How do I take this? melody line and flesh it out so it becomes a fully fledged tune or a presentable piece so that's how this came into existence nice hey um so thank you so much for for being here with me and um i just want to remind people that your work is going to be in denver in january uh, hot diggity hot diggity dog <laughs> um and also i just want to kind of give you a little plug here follow david on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on Twitter, um, because you not only see images, but you also get the little backstory and some really great thoughts about um, art and life and music. Um, and you, David also teaches. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of that that kind of comes through, which honestly, I think is really wonderful for collectors to listen to, you know, all of this stuff that we're talking about. So anyway, just want to say and sign up for his newsletter on um, davidmichaelslonum.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hey, thank you so much for being here. As always, just what an enlightening conversation. Thank I you. It's great to talk to you. I just want to say in closing, we're all on a journey. Uh, so wherever you are on the journey, I just want to encourage you to keep going. And if, if my work at the moment does not resonate with you, that's fine. I'm not offended, but find the work that does and don't doubt your soul. You, you there's something inside of you that knows your own name when you hear it. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. yeah. Yep. It's true. Oh my so, gosh. So go there. <laughs> What a gift. What a gift to communicate with people without words. Yeah. It's an amazing thing. That is. It lasts for lifetimes. Many, many. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad I know you. What a wonderful conversation. I'm glad I know you too. <laughs> Thank you, Rose. <laughs> Thank you, really David. Take good care. Right. I'm sure we will be chatting again soon. I hope. Take care. All right. Bye -bye.